Welcome to At Issue. Thank you so much for being with us for a conversation about consolidation and unfunded mandates in the state of Illinois. My name is H. Wayne Wilson. I'm going to consolidate that name shortly. And we have 7,000 units of local government. You're supposed to laugh at that. <laughs> 7,000 units of local government in the state of Illinois. That is nearly 2,000 more than the second state in the nation. That is Texas with just over 5,000 units of government. We have 54 units of government per 100,000 population in the state of Illinois, 54. The next state is Pennsylvania with 38. The next one after that is Ohio with 33. So by far, the state of Illinois has a lot of units of local government. We're going to discuss a task force that was created a year ago and has now concluded its report on how we might change that in the state. And to have that conversation are two task force members. One is Ryan Spain. Ryan, you will recognize as being a Peoria County board member, but for today's conversation, he is a member of the Local Government Consolidation and Unfunded Mandates Task Force. Thank you, Ryan, for being mm -hmm. here. Also on that task force is Mike Bigger. Mike is a former county board chair at uh, Stark County mm -hmm. and is currently on the Illinois Human Rights Commission. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. And joining us uh, is Beth Derry. Beth was not on the task force, but plays a very critical role in this because some of the recommendations involve school districts. And Beth happens to be the regional superintendent for education for Peoria County. And before we talk about the task force, I just want to talk about consolidation in ROEs. Uh, sure. Uh, just a real short history of why that's happened. In 1993, the regional offices consolidated, and then again, we consolidated last year. We went from 44 regional offices within the state down to 35. Within this area of the state, which is considered Area 3, there were 10 regional offices, and now there are five. And that was quite a task, um, to see the laundry list of things that the regional offices had to do to pull off the consolidation, everything from records to inventories to um, efficiencies in reaching out to the people that they serve, it was quite an undertaking in our area. And the reason I asked that question was, there's gonna be an undertaking if any of the 27 recommendations from your task force are to occur. What is the realistic opinion of the task force members as to what might happen with this report? Well, I think it's a very serious report and a lot of time and effort when it went into it. So I think we fully expect some really good legislation to come from this. And I think uh, primarily uh, people will see that it's a way to empower the local jurisdictions not to compel consolidation or compel any activity, but to actually empower and return to the local jurisdictions the ability to react and to, to enact legislation in uh, referendum type issues that are specific to the needs of the local community. Most of these, not all, but most of these would require legislation? Correct. Correct. So when, when we look at the, the legislature, uh, it's heavily democratic. Your panel was a bipartisan effort. What were the votes like on the, uh, on the I know there's 27 of them. Some were sure. unanimous. Sure. Most were unanimous. Uh, all had very strong majority support uh, along the way. Uh, I think that we were very fortunate to have a bipartisan group of state legislators, uh, and then local elected officials representing cities, counties, school districts, uh, other units of government like township. Uh, and I think the diversity that was brought forward from a political standpoint and then a government standpoint really made for strong consideration of each of these uh, items. So uh, by far the 27 recommendations uh, all received very strong support from the task force. Of those 27, six dealt with townships. You mentioned townships. Let's talk about some of those to give people an idea of some of the detail that you got into. Uh, one, and remember, the word that's being used here is allow. You said it's not compelling. It's to allow local units to make a decision. Uh, to allow townships, townships to consolidate with coterminous municipalities by referendum. So what, what exactly does that mean? Well, I think a township that is, is connected directly to a municipality uh, to allow those jurisdictions, it makes a lot of sense to look at consolidation and economies of scale and efficiencies and that type of thing. So I think, again, it's just a tool in this overall toolbox, like Ryan had mentioned earlier when we were talking, just to, to give jurisdictions the ability to take action at the local level. 
Um, I think that's the whole purpose. So, so in Peoria, the city of Peoria and the township of Peoria are the same. Is that correct? Uh, p p pretty much. Uh, so the, the town of Peoria, Peoria Township, is entirely uh, nested within the city of Peoria. There are some other townships that are within the corporate limits of uh, the Rich city. Woods Rich and, Woods, right. Medina, mm -hmm. uh, Kickapoo, just l s small areas. But Peoria Township uh, is entirely confined within the city of Peoria. What we learned through this task force is that if any community wanted to engage in opportunities for consolidating any unit of government, it, it, it may be township, it may be something entirely different, but often they're limited uh, by state statute for their efforts to pursue consolidation. And so one of the things that are included in the recommendations are opportunities to allow all communities across the state of Illinois to exercise some of these consolidation opportunities if they would choose to do so. Again, it's not mandatory, but simply giving them a tool uh, to help provide value to taxpayers in their community. One of those uh, limitations was there is on the books, and I don't understand this, but there is a limit as to size of township. It can be no larger than 126 square miles, and that causes a problem for some counties. Yeah, there was an effort in McHenry County up uh, in the Chicago suburban area. They wanted to consolidate all of the townships within their county uh, to a total of four. And they ran into this problem uh, where they discovered that in the state of Illinois, uh, there is a cap on the total size of any given township. So one of the recommendations is to remove that cap, again, so that if a community chooses to pursue a consolidation opportunity, for whatever reason they may be interested in it, they would have the flexibility to do so. One of the issues that you addressed was that townships have various tax rates. So in the first year of consolidation, a county can use the lower tax rate of two consolidating townships. It's, that's correct. And I think we kind of talked about a, a hold harmless approach to that so that it doesn't create a disincentive to consolidate because the taxpayers are feeling as if one jurisdiction is going to get taxed higher now than they were previously. So it allows that opportunity to really hold those two jurisdictions harmless and not have a negative impact on the, on the tax base. Another example is in the uh, area of assessments. If you have fewer than 15,000 parcels, or I think it's one billion in assessed valuation, but fewer than 15,000 parcels, then you can consolidate, the, dissolve the township assessor and create a single a countywide assessor. Correct. And that would be an elected assessor. We're now, for instance, in Stark County, where I'm from, a county of 6,000 people, we have an appointed assessor. And, and, and frankly, at the township level, it's getting more difficult to get people who actually can get certified and qualified to provide, to provide that function. And if it can be under the umbrella of a countywide assessor in a county like Stark of 6,000 people, it makes total sense to me to at least offer that opportunity to the county board in counties like Stark to, to, to pursue that approach. And one other township issue was the consolidation of road and bridge districts. If the, the current law says that if you have fewer than five miles, you may consolidate. Sure. And you felt that was not realistic. Well, again, uh, there are some communities, there are some townships that may be interested in pursuing uh, an opportunity to consolidate some of their uh, road and bridge districts. Being a township road commissioner is one of the most difficult jobs, I think. And so we've got a lot of people that do it very well. And again, for those townships uh, that are enjoying those services, uh, they're not impacted by any of these recommendations. But for communities that wish to take a different approach, it's one more tool and opportunity for them to consider. Permissive in nature. Permissive, but not mandatory. Let's turn to school districts. Um, I think that individuals probably don't really understand the, there's there's about 1430 townships and people go townships uh, I just want my road plowed and I want my road smoothed out etc but and they don't care whether it's township county city but schools they tend to that's personal very the one of the recommendations is to give the Illinois State Board of Education the flexibility to incentivize the outcome of school consolidation before I talk to Beth about this, explain that. Incentivize, I, I'm not sure I understand this recommendation. Well, one of the recommendations, this one in particular, uh, is to offer uh, some type of incentive 
and we were not prescriptive of what exactly that needed to be. Uh, but rather than uh, compelling and coercing school districts to consider consolidation, perhaps from uh, uh, split districts uh, into a unit approach, uh, can we take an opportunity to help them do so, to help pursue opportunities uh, for more collaboration and possible uh, consolidation. And so that means uh, perhaps in the future that state funding uh, could be directed uh, in a way that would help school districts that just may need a little nudge to come together uh, and eliminate some of the duplication in order to provide either better value for taxpayers or a more streamlined and unified curriculum. Any of those things may be useful. But again, it needs to be up to the local voters, the local taxpayers to help drive forward those initiatives. So from a practical perspective, what does that mean for school districts in central Illinois? Well, I so greatly appreciate the approach that this report has taken about getting the incentives in the right place and about looking to local communities to what makes sense to them. Um, in our area, we have several grade school districts and a high school district, and there are some great efficiencies that are currently going on. So what is it, and I appreciate the word, a nudge in the right direction that would get them to look at how could we be even more efficient if we work together as a consolidated unit school district? Let's use a, an example or two. Uh, Limestone High School has eight sure. feeder districts. Yes. And because we rely on the property tax to a great degree, more so than ever before, some of those districts happen to have a tax base that includes the chemical plants along Route 24. Mm -hmm. Some of those districts aren't fortunate enough to have a solid industrial tax base. What is the likelihood, what is needed to get eight feeder districts to consolidate into limestone? Let me start by saying that I work with those districts on a regular basis and it is very exciting to see how they already cooperate and uh, look for efficiencies. They meet on a monthly basis as a group and they do things such as share staff, they share transportation cost, they have cooperatives for their supplies, materials, papers, food, those kinds of things, looking for ways that they can all work together. And so how can we then take that to the next step? Um, you've got to find the incentives for those communities to want to work together and to cooperate to um, look towards consolidation. Because right now, the way that things are structured, those incentives just aren't there. And part of that is the, the uh, tax base. Absolutely. Because it's property taxes. And we have shrinking state aid, the general uh, state school aid formula. The, the state is not paying what it should be paying on a percentage basis. Oh, absolutely. The uh, general state aid is stuck in a 2009 figure of $6,114. And since 2009, the costs for school districts have only gone up. Things for salaries, um, insurance, all of those different, different types of things, commodities that we use, costs have only gone up, but that figure has not gone up. And also, that figure has been prorated. And so for the past uh, several years, we don't get that full amount of that 2009 level. It's prorated at 89 percent. This year it was 90 percent. And so that is a challenge in and of itself is how to budget around what is a figure from 2009 that we know we're only going to get a partial amount. And I, I know the task force was charged with, with addressing unfunded mandates and consolidation, but was there any conversation about school aid formula and, and property taxes at all? Oh, yeah, there, there definitely was. There was a lot of discussion with the education and, and the need for uh, a funding re reform. Now, I don't recall any direct action that we took in that regard, but it, it clearly was. I remember one of our meetings, the local or the state university systems were all uh, represented and talked about the problems they face in procurement. And I'm not really sure what, exactly how we addressed that, but, but all of these funding issues were, were part of the discussion, clearly. There were other issues that addressed school districts. One was to to allow, again, the privatization of driver's education. Why was that in, uh, discussed with the task force? Again, we heard, we received testimony from local officials all throughout the state of Illinois. We had meetings throughout the entire state of Illinois. And what you would hear from some communities and some school districts that mandates that were probably well-intentioned actions of the legislature to compel driver's ed or uh, PE requirements 
et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, we're creating an enormous burden on certain school districts and on certain units of government. And so we wanted to empower those districts to have the flexibility to consider a different way forward that could be more efficient for them, allow them to focus their resources on other priorities, and again, provide a greater value for taxpayers. So Beth, what are you, are, when you're talking to school districts, are they looking at privatization? I mean, I know it has to be okay, but is that an area where they really want to see some, lat uh, some latitude in, in being able to operate? The organizations that I belong to, including the Illinois Association of School Administrators and the Principals Association, all look at some of the bigger unfunded mandates. And may I say, within the report, there are some very quality data about the number of unfunded mandates just since the early 90s to today. It's gone up more than 100% the amount of mandates that school districts must comply with. And that is one of the functions of my office, is to visit all of the school districts and to ensure that they're complying with those mandates. And so when you're looking at the mandate for daily PE, you're looking at the mandate for driver's education. Those are high cost mandates that don't have the resources to support it. And so when you start looking at what are the core functions of a school district that they need to provide, the students and families that they serve, some of those things have to be part of the discussion as to how to cut costs and be more efficient. And physical education, you referenced, uh, some schools just can't, because the requirement is four years of physical education. The, we are one of six states that mandates daily PE for students K-12. But it's probably a good idea, <laughs> knowing the obesity problem. Absolutely, we have, and so there, there is the crossroads of, it is a mandate that has, as Mr. Spain put very eloquently, it had the best intentions at heart. But when it comes to the day-to-day -day operations of a school district, it's a very challenging mandate. Was there, how much discussion was there on the task force about allowing some flexibility with the schools to, I mean, there wasn't a recommendation, was it, was there discussion about reducing it to three years of physical education, or how was yeah. that approached? No, there was no direct uh, approach in, in that regard, other than just, again, empowering the local school districts to do what's right in their jurisdiction, to give that power back to the taxpayers, the school boards, and the leaders, and again, and no way to compel them to go to a certain level of physical education, but just give them the, the flexibility and the way to manage that issue at their local level and their local jurisdiction. Let's go to, we, we mentioned that some of the votes were unanimous, uh, but some were not. And uh, I assume that one of those was the prevailing wage provision. Can you explain why the task force decided to have that included in the report? Yeah, there was one item. It was a recommendation uh, to uh, consider prevailing wage reforms for local government. Doesn't mean eliminate prevailing wage uh, necessarily, but are there opportunities for uh, local governments to create uh, different thresholds for where prevailing wage would be required uh, for a community or a public project uh, are things like uh, small landscaping projects. Perhaps they should be exempt from the traditional prevailing wage requirements that uh, would be experienced in most communities. So it's another item to put on the table, uh, hopefully to save money for taxpayers or to be more efficient with our tax dollars. And so uh, I don't think that it was uh, a great controversy in terms of uh, the totality of, of this task force and its work. But again, just creating more opportunities uh, for communities to really chart their own destiny forward and be as accountable and efficient with tax dollars as possible. Was that the same thought process with the uh, collective bargaining issue? Right, I, I think exactly. Those are, those are both very uh, very strong and emotional issues in a lot of people's minds. And, and again, I don't think it was a way to look at eliminating collective bargaining or eliminating prevailing wage. Uh, but again, just to, re I keep going back to the fact that local control, local jurisdiction, um, the prevailing wage, for one thing, I know there was a provision in there to up that threshold to 250000 before prevailing wage would apply. And in smaller jurisdictions like Stark County, our local contractors are, are unable to even bid on, on local projects. And so I view a lot of these as a way to make it possible for local providers, local contractors to be part of the bidding process and be part of those projects within their own community, whether it be collective bargaining or prevailing wage. So uh, on some of these where we're talking about collective bargaining, we're talking about prevailing wage, those are clearly issues where uh, democratic lawmakers are in favor of maintaining the status quo. 
So in making these recommendations, was there any discussion with regard to, well, this isn't even going to see the light of day in the legislature, so why bother? I think the report is very pragmatic. I don't think there are items in the report that are incendiary that could never be considered by reasonable Democrats and Republicans in the legislature. You know, when we talk about collective bargaining, local communities are very familiar with bargaining over uh, wages, uh, for example. Uh, but should we bargain over the staffing ratios that should be required within some of our departments? I think as a local official, that's taking things too far. And we need to be empowered here at a local level to make decisions about uh, what should the size of our workforce be, for example. So it's not abandoning collective bargaining or prevailing wage in the state of Illinois, but understanding that decisions sometimes made by the legislature have a trickle-down effect that uh, are very difficult uh, for local communities. We spent a lot of time talking about pension reform issues. We, we're familiar with that topic as a statewide issue, but the pension rules and obligations for local communities are also set by the state legislature. And it's, from a, a local city perspective, one of the biggest factors that are crowding out our tax bill. And so all of these items need to be on the table with an understanding that we need to be more efficient with our tax dollars, that the property taxes in this state of Illinois are very high, they're the high, second highest in the country, and that we need additional tools available for communities uh, to do what they think is best for their taxpayers. And with regard to unfunded mandates, uh, one of the recommendations is to allow the governor to have the right to amendatorily veto legis uh, legislation with unfunded mandates where if economically feasible, so that in an area like Stark County, you mentioned, you know, expenses. What was the thought process behind including that? Well, I think it's just a, a clear realization that unfunded mandates are every bit as much of a problem in Illinois as our consolidation issues, and we have to find a way to address that and really to hold, I think, to hold the legislature responsible uh, in passing legislation that has a direct impact to a local jurisdiction with no revenue stream to support that mandate. So I think that there's also a move to set up a committee uh, about unfunded mandates to take a look at those and to go back 15 years on previously enacted unfunded mandates. And I think a lot of these proposals that we put out there aren't directing the legislature to take specific action. I think it's an indication that we feel as if that discussion needs to be taking place on all these issues, on unfunded mandates. So a lot of these proposals are simply asking the legislature to do their job and to step up and to make some hard choices and some hard decisions and be accountable for those. But one that was on a statewide basis was the four-year moratorium. The task force is recommending a four-year moratorium on the creation of any new lo of units of government unless it's a consolidation. Right completely common sense. I think it's a very reasonable recommendation, a four-year moratorium, no new units of government in Illinois. We already have the most units of government, far more than any other state in the country. So let's say, let's commit ourselves, community leaders all across the state, that we will not be in the business of making any new unit of government uh, for the next several years, unless, of course, as you mentioned, H, that it's the consolidation uh, of other units of government, two existing units of government into one new one, for example. And in, in, in place of consolidation, you also have recommended that there be an encouragement for state agencies to, to say on the local level, you can share equipment, you can share facilities, et cetera. Sure. Absolutely. I think it's very similar to intergovernmental agreements that we enter into now where it makes economic sense and again you achieve these economies of scale. It just makes total sense to do that. And I know in Stark County, for instance, we partner with the Henry County Health Department and we have a consolidated uh, transportation system in Stark County. So I think any way that we can encourage folks to, to look at those economies of scale, it, it just makes sense. And that's already happening at the school uh, arena where you may not be consolidating but you are sharing. Out of the regional office, I run a very large food cooperative. You know, it's a small thing, but many, many school districts outside of Peoria County even are a member to get some cost reduction and some efficiencies. Absolutely, there are many areas where we can be more efficient, where we can cooperate. It just makes sense. And is that just the basic theme of the task force is let's, even if it's not mandated, let's look at where we can, hey, 
we do the same thing. Let's see if we can't get some efficiency. Absolutely. That's something that really is a strong spirit in Peoria right now. Uh, we have very strong cooperation between the city of Peoria and Peoria County. Uh, we've executed intergovernmental agreements. Uh, we have uh, entered into joint activities like Enterprise Zone and uh, uh, Public Works, traffic signaling, road agreements. It's all about how do we provide common sense value for our taxpayers to use those tax dollars more efficiently and more effectively. And with that, we have to consolidate here and call it into the program. We hope the conversation continues at home. Let me say thank you to Ryan Spain, a task force member, and to Beth Derry, who's the superintendent of regional education for Peoria County. Also, thank you to Mike Bigger, who also was on the task force and a former chair of the Stark County Board. Thank you, thank you to all three of you. We'll thank be you. back next week with another edition of At Issue. This time, we're going to be visiting with the new president of Bradley University. Gary Roberts will be here for the conversation. Please join us then.